Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. God in his kingdom. Moved by the Spirit, one who lives in love lives in God. And God lives in him. What a wonderful thing is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, we got some wonderful family here this evening and they're just a little house cleaning we're gonna do tonight. Before we go to our subject, our subject tonight is going to be disappointment. I told the audience and they thought, yay, yay, disappointment. <laughs> now, we decided, the sisters and I, why? Because we've been judging by our mail. We also decided we would have every week something called the answer, the question of the week. And we judge by the letters we get. This letter is from a sixth grader. I want to read it to you. And then I'll give her our answer. And then we'll go on to disappointment. I hope she's not disappointed in the end. <laughs> My name is Amanda. And I'm in the sixth grade. My mom just read me a column in our Catholic paper, which says, quote, Original sin is not really something done by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise upon the promptings of the devil. But my religion book says Eve, Adam's wife, was enticed by the tempter Satan to disobey God. She did so and also got Adam to disobey God. By disobeying God, Adam opposed God's plan, and we call this sin original sin. What is the truth? Now, this letter was written to the ecclesiastical authority of this particular child. So, the author or the article she refers to says original sin is rather a basic human tendency towards sin. Well, if that's all it is, we still got it, don't we? <laughs> you got it, I got it, everybody's got it. Okay, so we won't read the article. But the moment this child, a sixth grader, wants to know the answer, is there original sin or is there not? This was the answer. With regard to your question of original sin, I think the author of the column and your re religious textbook are both right. Theological concepts as original sin are very complex and can be addressed on different levels. Well, I don't know, I just think if if they goof, they goof. I don't know how many levels you could put that on. You know, original sin was plain and simple disobedience to the will of God. Big time disobedience to the will of God. Big time. So I don't know why it should be so complex. In this case, it's not a question of being correct or the other incorrect. 
with the passage of time and your growth in maturity, I am sure if you continue to apply yourself, you will resolve this question satisfactorily. Well, sweetheart, let me tell you something. It's a shame you can't go to the right place and get the right answer. You ask me, is there original sin? Well, if you haven't got this catechism, you need to get one. Why? It's a shame, you know, that an author of a column and an ecclesiastical authority didn't know the answer, and this sixth grader had a sneaking suspicion. Sneaking suspicion. There's something radically wrong. So, sweetheart, I hope you're listening because the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a seductive voice opposed to God. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being the fallen angel called Satan. Okay. The doctrine of original, now we're coming up to something that is not, we can't say it's correct or incorrect, and you have to be a big girl before you understand it. The doctrine, you, if you're a Catholic, you're obliged to believe in original sin, see? The doctrine of original sin closely connected with that of redemption. There would have been no need for redemption if there wasn't original sin. Provides lucid discernment of man's situation and activity. Now, here's another answer to your question. By our first parents' sin, our first parents' sin, the devil has acquired a certain denominate dominion over man. Even though man remains free, original sin entails captivity under the power of him who thenceforth has the power of death. That is the devil. The good book. Now, What does baptism do? This is what Jesus came for, you see? When he came and he suffered and died, he came to deliver us, not from the consequences, but from that original sin. Article 1263. By baptism, all sins are forgiven. Original sin and personal sins as well as all punishment due to sin. Don't you wish you could be baptized just tomorrow, huh? Oof, boy. In those who have been reborn, nothing remains that would impede their entry into the kingdom. If somebody dropped dead after baptism, they go straight to heaven. The answer to this week's question is, number one, original sin is not an opinion. It's not a conclusion you may come to when you grow up. It's a doctrine of the church. You must believe in it. Number two, Jesus came, suffered, and died. So that, so that through baptism, we may be delivered and forgiven that original sin. Third, after baptism, you and I receive the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have what we call divine indwelling. See, Jesus merited all of that by that awesome pain and suffering of his entire life. So, sweetheart, 
you're one smart sixth grader. I congratulate your mother who must have taught you a lot. I encourage all of you parents to please It'll save you a postage stamp writing to me if you get this book. Now, we have a lot of soft covers. For a $20 donation, I will send you a soft cover catechism. Please get one. It's important if you want to check out what you read, check out what you hear. While you're living, go for the truth, you know? Go for it. Don't be satisfied with half-truths or somebody's opinion. So, the reason we're going to have disappointment as our little chit-chat this evening is because this child was disappointed. Very disappointed. Disappointed when she read the article disappointed when she saw her catechism and said it doesn't match. Disappointed when she got the letter that tells her both are accurate. Well, it seems to be the way things are today. We have a, a kind of pick your own doctrine or dogma. Pick it yourself. Which means, if this one's wrong, he's right because he's wrong. <laughs> Did you ever say anything like that before? But this child is disappointed. Her whole life could have been changed. And so we need to ask and we need to address disappointment. This child was disappointed in your teachers. Many of us are disappointed in ourselves. Some are disappointed in God because he doesn't answer all your requests with a yes. And some are disappointed in others, you see? In other words, people don't come up to your expectations. Did you ever see that? Huh? And the world uses that today to destroy people. Somebody's running for office. Maybe he's an innocent old guy or young guy. <laughs> and they'll come out with stuff he did when he was 10 years old. He threw peas at his mother at table. Or he smashed a window in a grocery store when he was 16. Well, we have that tendency to always come out with the worst in everybody. And so today, you're hardly disappointed anymore. Did you ever notice that? If some scandal comes out, you're not disappointed. Yeah, 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 that's the way it is. We've been conditioned. We have been conditioned to disappointment. We can't, so the apostles were terribly disappointed in our Lord. Weren't they? Isn't that why the disciples went to Emmaus and, and, and said, oh, we thought he was the one that was going to come and, and deliver us from Rome. Oh, they were terribly disappointed. And our Lord said to them, oh, foolish men, why is it so hard for you to understand the scriptures? You know, our Lord was disappointed in the Pharisees because they didn't love him, because they didn't even believe in him. And they tried always to kind of uh, do him in. There's disappointment in our Lord's mind, I'm sure, when he saw all the people he healed in the crowd that he knew when they said, crucify him. We're disappointed. We're disappointed. Sometimes parents are disappointed with their children. I wanted you to make all A's. They came home with all F's or C's or whatever your grading is today. We're disappointed. 
we thought we were going to have a very successful business and we were really going to make it, and we didn't. We're disappointed. Now, sometimes disappointment is good. It's good. Have you ever been disappointed in something that didn't happen? I wanted to go to that picnic so bad and it rained. I'm disappointed. And then I found out on that very highway was an awesome wreck. And just about that time, I would have been one of those 35 cars. And we begin to realize, oh, what I thought was a disappointment was really a grace from God. Sometimes disappointment is an opportunity to grow in holiness. Sometimes we put too much human faith in people, in things, in success. Did you ever notice you want that car so bad? And a month after you, uh, you get it, you look at it, and it's just, uh, got a scratch on it. Some old lady bumped my fender, and it's all bent in. And all of a sudden, that, that joy you had in getting it, did you ever notice that? You're all ready for a vacation and you go and the kids are yelling and screaming the whole time going, the whole time coming back. You're exhausted when you come home. And you thought you were going to just lay in the sun and <sighs> breathe. And all you did when you got home was go to bed. A disappointment. Sometimes you work very hard for something, maybe a diploma in some particular subject, and you make it, and you can't find a job. Nobody is looking for a zoologist. You're disappointed. Now, what do we do with all of these disappointments? And I think they come to everybody every day. You make an appointment, and the doctor, you got a bad tooth, the doctor called, Doctor sick today, come back next week. <sighs> what are I do with my tooth? I don't know. She had other dentist. See what I'm saying? Little things, big things. All disappointments. You know, in the gospel, the gospel itself, if you look at the life of Jesus in the gospel, you'll find because he saw the will of God in everything, he was never disappointed. In his human nature, he, could, he was never disappointed because even before Pilate, and I've said this a hundred times, the most fascinating part of the New Testament to me is when he told Pilate the Father gave him the authority to judge him. Oh, that's a big one. I would have been disappointed in someone who condemned me for no reason. And how could, he, how could he forgive his enemies? Look down from the cross and then um, say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. How could he say that if he yielded to disappointment? See? So what did he say? How did he handle disappointment? He handled disappointment by forgiveness. Oh, now that's a big one, isn't it? If you have a disappointment you can't handle, why don't you call? Maybe we could help you with it. But if you look at Jesus in the scriptures, he handled his disappointments by forgiveness. And how many of you are disappointed over yourself? You promised your wife you wouldn't take another drink. And three, four months pass, and there you are again. And you're disappointed. And what do you do? You take three more drinks. See, wrong approach. Forgiveness, forgiving yourself and asking your wife or children to forgive you. 
and greater determination not to fall again. How many people never strive for holiness because they're so conscious of their sinner condition? And as a result, they don't even try. They forget there's people like Mary Magdalene, there's people like St. Augustine, all great sinners. You name it, they did it. And yet, you see, their love for Jesus, their desire to accept his mercy kept them from disappointment, yielding, yielding to disappointment. How many of you have stopped even going to church because you were disappointed in a priest, in a religious, or a, a parishioner? Well, in that incident, don't be disappointed. We are all filled with that concupiscence, we used to call it, of original sin. We have that weakness. If you were to pray for the, this kind of, in this category, for all the people who disappoint you, don't leave the church. Don't leave the church. Stay there. Pray for these people. See, we can make reparation for a disappointment, even if we're the ones who caused another to be disappointed. You can always apologize. I'm sorry I didn't come up to your expectation. I'm sorry I didn't give, get the job I, I thought I was going to get. I'm sorry, I didn't make the grade you wanted me to make. And I didn't make it because I, I just didn't take advantage of the time. See, if you're the one disappointed, you can make up for it by forgiveness. If you cause disappointment in someone else, you can still make up for it by an apology. One is you forgive, in the other you ask forgiveness. Do you see what happens? There, there has to be some kind of appropriate action. You have to do something. You're going to either forgive or ask forgiveness. If you don't do that, it's going to eat you up, isn't it, huh? It's going to eat you up. Because I do, that's what our Lord, Lord said, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Every time you're angry, you're disappointed. Would you say that's true? Huh? Yeah. yeah, it's true. Most of the time, anyway. So you got angry and then you're disappointed. So what happens when you get angry? What happens when you get angry? You have less love. Hmm? And sometimes we, we're geared to expect too much from people too soon. Too much, too soon. Too much, too soon. If your son or daughter is a teenager, you can't expect them. You know, we used to have an old thing we used to say, you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Yeah, did you ever hear that? All you old people my age, you heard that? Yeah? You can't put a, a wise head on, on young shoulders. They have to learn sometimes the way you learned. Rather than yielding to disappointment because your children did not turn out the way you wanted. And you did everything. Don't blame yourself. Pray. Pray. We spent more time in prayer than gossiping. Wouldn't that be a day, huh? Wouldn't that be a day if you spent more time praying for somebody? and talking about it. If editors of newspapers and magazines did that, they wouldn't know what to write. Well, see, nothing is news anymore except great scandal. If it's not scandalous, they won't print it. Did you ever see somebody printing good news? 
well, not everything is bad, but they inform you, and then they have pros and cons. And by the time you get through the evening paper, you don't know where you are. You found out a lot of things about people you shouldn't have. And this one, you're disappointed. And you can be disappointed in everybody because we expect so much. And really, the situation would be greatly helped in our lives if, if we forgave and we apologized and we loved in spite of our disappointment or maybe because of it, because of it. Do you remember our dear Lord when, when Peter disappointed him? You know, it says Peter, after the third denial, our Lord passed him by and looked at him. Now, see what Jesus did? The look was not a look of disappointment. It was a look of love. And what happened? Peter repented. And he cried and cried and cried. Tradition has it he cried during his whole life, every time he thought about it. So how was Jesus' reaction to such a disappointment? Love. A loving glance. That's what disappointment did to Jesus. Last week we were talking about how God brings good out of everything, huh? Good out of everything. Disappointment many times is the result of us perhaps not thinking ourselves, how is God bringing good out of this disappointment for me? Many people have changed their whole vocation because of a disappointment. They were going to do this work and suddenly a disappointment came along, went that direction. Scandal comes from disappointment. See, my Lord one day said, woe to the man from whom scandal comes. It were better for him if a millstone would be put around his neck and he would drown in the sea. Whoa. <laughs> the gentle Jesus, huh? Oh, wow. Yeah, the gentle Jesus. Because he knew, he knew many times when, when scandal brings disappointment, disappointment brings depression and desolation. See, that's, that's why you want to keep away if you can't. We all feel, you can't help feeling disappointed. You could be disappointed over the weather. Something goes wrong. You know, we, we had our sprinkler system. We were supposed to sprinkle 10 minutes and something broke. It sprinkled two hours. <sighs> Everything's muddy and, ugh. See? Well, you look at what you thought you could do something with, and now you can't. But it doesn't matter. Ground is ground, and if it's wet today, it'll be dry tomorrow. So what? Many disappointments in our life, we can kind of shrug off. You ever do that? Just shrug it off? You're in a hurry to go somewhere, and there's an accident five miles away, and you're five miles behind waiting between 2,000 cars. Now what do you do? You know, I'm going to give you a, a, a parable. You want a parable? An angelic parable? Okay. I'll give you an angelic parable. See, there was a man, and he's, he's got an opportunity of getting a job that's got twice the salary he's making now. And the opportunity is there. He has to be there on time, though. But he's there. He's, he's already an hour early. And he's driving up a hill, and he's almost spending the money. Did you ever spend it before you got it? Yeah, everybody does that, right? So he, and he's even going to give 10% to God. I mean, he's going to be really generous and tied, you see? And he's coming up the hill, and almost to the top, 
he hears this bang and he's got two flats. He veers off the road and he looks. He doesn't notice a car passing by at 90 miles an hour. Well, it was a lonely road. It was hours before he got this fixed and he lost a job. Disappointment, see? Disappointment. What he didn't know was the car that passed him by had a drunk driver in it. And it was weaving this way and that way and this way and that way. Had he not had the blowout and veered to the side, he would be with St. Peter about 20 years too soon. So the only thing he knew, though, was he didn't get an answer to his prayer. God's permitting will saved his life, but he didn't know that. See? He didn't know that. And he probably won't know it till eternity. Now, at that point, see, there's where your Christianity has to come up. If you were to say, Lord, I know there was a reason for you to allow this, I'll look for another job. That's what you call holiness. So he takes an awesome disappointment and he makes it a time in a vehicle for great holiness. See, you like my parable? You like my parable? I'll make another one. Thank you. But see, we don't, we don't know. We don't know what God is going to do. See, how many times have you been disappointed in your life and maybe you just miss getting killed or miss going into an awesome occasion of sin? See what I'm saying? So please, let's, when we get disappointed over little things or big things or weather or loss of job, whatever, trust, 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 trust in the Lord and ask him to help you. We have a call. Hello? Mother Angelica? Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. Well, this good, that's Paula. close to home. And what is your question? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm not in the least disappointed with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But... Uh, some of my Protestant friends here and elsewhere are a bit confused about temptations from without in the world mm -hmm. and the difference between that and the serpent. And I would wish you would elaborate a little bit on the fact that most of our temptations really reside within us because right. of original sin. That's right. Thank you. There, the woman can teach you a lesson. You're right. All these tendencies within us are consequences of original sin. And we're very often disappointed because we feel anger. We feel uh, jealousy. We feel oversensitivity. We feel greed or we feel pride. Or you feel lustful or you feel a thousand things. Many of those things do come from us. You want to blame the devil. You know, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. I mean, maybe you're doing so bad, he didn't even pay attention to you, you know? <laughs> Don't take for granted the devil did it. Some of these things, and they're neither good or bad. It's what I do with them. You know, sometimes there is just anger. You know, the Lord didn't say, blessed are those who make themselves a doormat. Did you ever read that anywhere? I didn't read that. So we're not, not talking about that. What we're saying is that many times our temptations do come from external sources. Some of your billboards today they used to be nice, innocent billboards. See? You used to have some kind of shaving lotion things. When I was a kid, they had little plaques and you used to go for a mile in Burma shave. Was that it? And, and you'd read that. They were entertaining. You wonder what was the last word, you know, something about 
I remember one, I can't remember the whole thing. It says something about a man is uh, uh, an orange, ha I mean, a, a peach has fuzz, um, but man's not a peach, it never was, something like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> use Burma shape. Anyway, it used to be you could enjoy things. Many a temptation comes from the billboards, magazines. Let me tell you one time when we, years and years and years ago, before television, before radio, before anything, we used to print mini books, tiny little things, we still do. And um, so I used to carry some with me and I'd put them anywhere I thought they needed to be. So the woman next to me in the doctor's office picked up a magazine and by golly, there was a Playboy. And I thought, God forgive this doctor, you know. <laughs> He's hard up to put Playboy in his office. So I said, aha. So I went in my pocket and I got a book called The Healing Power of Suffering. And I took the book like this, pow, and I closed it. <laughs> and, and the man next to me said, did you know you put it in the center fold? <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> So those kind of things can come external, a lot of it external today. The way people dress, the way they talk, the way they act, even the way they comb their hair. And, and I never saw poor hair. I feel sorry for people's hair. It goes every which direction and every kind of possible color. And then when they're tired of it, they shave it in different directions all at the same time. And they're going, they don't seem to care. You see some that have it this way, and, and then some go this way, and then some go this way. And I thought, if I were a hare, I would, what would I do to this person, you know? Would I bite him or do something? And a lot of those disappointments, and a lot of those that do come from outside, that's outside. That is, we could say the devil inspired it. However, many of our tendencies are within. See? See? Outside sources help the tendency. If a man's driving, and he may be saying the rosary, and he sees some billboards very lustful, he's going to have lustful thoughts. That's why you got to watch what you read. You got to watch what you read. Sometimes the things you read interfere with your faith. They, they put up such questions and doubts. They don't enlighten you. They don't enlighten you. So there is a tendency inside to be jealous. I told you about the twins who came in. They all had a, one, uh, both had an all day sucker. One hit it. The other one gave me a lick. Well, they were only about three, four years old. Right away, the tendency to selfishness was in one, the tendency to generosity in the other. And I had a tendency not to lick, a licked <laughs> sucker. <laughs> but I did it anyway. See, those are, we're born with those. And all our life, we have a wonderful span life that our dear Lord gives us and the whole purpose of it is that I cooperating with his wondrous grace eradicate out of myself and substituting for me Jesus himself the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit so I have divine indwelling and that's why repentance, 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 repentance is so important today. If we don't repent as a world, as a nation, as an individual, as a family, as a community, and the workplace, I think this terrible rat race of sin 
and disobedience and immorality. And now we seek everywhere to reduce humanity to a handful. How foolish, huh? How foolish. So, I hope that answered your question. We have another question. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you? From? Biloxi, Mississippi. And what is your question? So, well, recently I wrote to a priest about his use of inclusive language due to your inspiration. Yeah. And he wrote me back a very angry letter. Saying <laughs> I was self-righteous. And oh, mis yeah. Misguided by a, I was being led by a misguided sense of protecting the church. And then I closed by asking for his prayer and that I was praying for him. You know, just pray for all priests. But he told me if I was praying to patronize him or try to save him, Jesus already did that, so put my prayers elsewhere. So I was just wondering how you would help me cope with this disappointment and what to continue to do when these things arise. Thank you. Well, I would not take his advice. I definitely would pray for him. I definitely would pray for him. The person who thinks he doesn't need prayers and he's saved, well, yeah, we are saved, but he cannot save us if I don't want to be saved. I have to will to be with Jesus, otherwise there would never be a hell. So you need to pray for him. You can expect angry replies. We got an angry call this morning. And one sister said, I'll pray for you. She said, don't you pray for me. Okay, okay. See, that's a bad sign, bad sign. Pray harder for him. I would say a rosary for that priest every day. If you can, say it before the blessed sacrament. Why? Because it will make you pleasing to the Lord. He is a priest of God. I mean, we can disagree with them and we can say they're wrong. But they are priests and we have to pray for them when they're wrong. When a person um, can't do anything else, really can't explain why they believe what they believe, their only recourse is anger, the wrong kind of anger. So they, they shift, they have a tendency to shift the emphasis on you rather than what you find fault with, you see? Because they really can't answer you. They can't answer you. So then there's something wrong with you that you even ask the question. Inclusive language is very bad, you know. I think I got something here that sounds kind of silly to me. I don't know if it sounds silly to you. Maybe I won't be able to find it, but this is one of those inclusive language things. Let's see. We must give and totally commit ourselves to a life of love and love for our, our human sisters and brothers. <laughs> what other kind of sisters and brothers? <laughs> you can't get mad at a man like this. <laughs> we can you see, he got scrupulous. He didn't want to. He had to say sisters and brothers, but he had to admit they're human. <laughs> well, uh, I, I won't. I won't say the rest of it. It gets worse as you go along. First of all, I would take it with a grain of salt, and I'd laugh over it. I would not get excited. I would not get excited. But with that laughter, with that smile. should come uh, great compassion because that priest or sister or man or woman or child, whatever, or whoever, all human, um, are giving up their eternity. At least it looks that way. Pray for them. Pray for them. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Yeah, where are you from? Oh, I'm Eleanor, and I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. Wonderful. I, oh, I can't believe after two years, I finally I'm got to I'm sorry. Oh, mother, you I got perseverance, I tell you. I tell you. <laughs> oh, yes. 
I learned it. Uh, mother, um, disappointments. Uh, I have four children. They were between 1961 and 68. I moved between three countries. And by the time my children were born, in the se- they went to school in the 70s. And I was getting very confused because I was converted when I was 12, just me. So there was nobody else in my family. And I thought, well, I'm so confused. I don't know if I'm doing right. I'm going to entrust these children to the church. I know. And this is what I did. I want them to have the best. I want them to have what, have what I had. But I was getting confused with what yeah. was going on. So I asked these, um, you know, I... I was fortunate enough to have a very good job. I was able to work the midnight shift, so I was home with my children during the daytime. And so I was involved in the school, but we were not allowed to interfere with their religious education. My sons were all the boys, and they all had First Communion confirmation. And I'm now... I'm realizing my children did not get anything. They went to the best schools that I could afford. Yeah. And mother, the disappointment I know. is so painful. It's now, very painful. Yeah. my children are telling me the only thing they remember is what I taught them. Well, isn't that wonderful, though? You see, the fact that you taught them is what they remember. And I would get this catechism. Don't be disheartened. There's no time for be disheartened. There's no time. The church is beginning to turn around. I know my liberal brother is having a fit at this point, but <laughs> I hate to tell you, or I'm very happy to tell you, that the church is turning around. More and more parishes, more and more people are really not only willing to fight for their faith, but persevere in the faith. They know their faith is here. The church is strong. The real church is strong without confusion. This catechism is the will of God for every Catholic in the world. If you don't accept it, well, everybody goes where he wills. And don't go with them if they're not on the right track. Remember what our Lord said? The way to heaven is narrow. Narrow. Please don't follow the wide road either on a religious level or a secular level. It leads to one place, and that's not a place you ever want to go. We have another call. Hello? Yes, sister. Hi. Well, hi. Where are you from? I'm from Miami. And what is your question? I really don't have a question, sister. I need um, everybody that is listening, and I need their prayers. Because um, I've been married for eight years. Do you have children? Huh? Yes, we, I have a seven-year-old son. Okay. My husband left me two months ago. And it's very painful. Yes, I know. I know. It's a kind of pain that nobody can describe unless you've gone through it. And I've saw my mother cry every day for years, years, and more years. More years than I want to even remember. And, but I can tell you one thing, and I know it may not be much comfort now, but I have the experience that you're talking about. Trust the Lord. Trust. As I look back on my life, on my young age, now, now, I wouldn't change it for the world. Oh, yeah, I would have wished that I had a wonderful family and more brothers and sisters. But it taught me, it gave me strength. It taught me a lot of things. It taught me compassion taught me understanding of people in the same position, taught me a lot about human nature, taught me that sometimes when you're down, that's when they kick you more. They don't always raise you up. 
Maybe this evening I can help to raise you up. Trust the Lord and know though you have lost someone you love, turn to Jesus and Mary. They love you more than this man could ever love you or a million, billion, trillion men could love you. Go to Jesus because there you will find the comfort and the peace you need to pick up your life and continue on. I got to say a little prayer for all of you, for all of your disappointments. For this one in particular, whose husband left her. My dad was gone two years before we even knew where he was. And that was an additional heartache, you see. So for all of these people, if they just hang in there and don't give up hope. Lord Jesus, you know the pain we have when we're disappointed. Disappointed in those we loved and we found they did not love us in return. Disappointed in things and people and in everything and everyone. We're disappointed sometimes in the world and those who run. Disappointed in ourselves. We place all of these disappointments tonight, Lord, in your sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary. We put them as in a furnace of love that you possess. And I ask, Lord, that you give all of these people for all the disappointments, for every disappointment is a heartache. It's not in the mind, it's in the heart. And you are the sacred heart of Jesus. And you are the immaculate heart of Mary, my sweet mother. Take them, put them together, all these broken hearts, mend them, and place them into your sacred heart and give them the courage to stand tall, persevere, and to trust in your wondrous providence, that providence that is always present, always there. Amen. Well, I hope we all learned something about disappointment. They come, they come, and they will always come. If you're disappointed in yourself, go to Jesus. Go to Mary. She understands. If you're disappointed in those you work with, pray for them. If you're disappointed with those in the church, pray for them. If you're disappointed in the world and leaders of the world, pray for them. If you're disappointed in your children, Pray for them. Remember what Our Lady said at Fatima. Pray, pray, pray the rosary. It would not only ease the pain in your heart, it will obtain grace for those that you pray for. No matter where they are or who they are, your prayer will reach them. And so, to the sixth grader, I say to you, continue pursuing your faith. Read that catechism often. Those that ask questions, you will be able to answer. For those of you that have no solutions to your problem, forgive. Ask forgiveness and repent. God bless you.